Now on New Hampshire Outlook. Welcome to this special edition of New Hampshire Outlook. I'm James Pendle of the Boston Globe, filling in for Beth Carroll. In today's show, we're going to examine one issue. Is the 2008 New Hampshire primary going to go down as the greatest ever? We have a number of reasons why. We have a number of reasons why not. We're going to examine those issues today on New Hampshire Outlook. <laughs> We're at St. Anselm College in Goffstown to meet with Dante Scala, a political science professor here who literally wrote the book on the New Hampshire primary. Get his perspective. Do you think that 2008 could be the greatest primary? It's got the potential to be one of the best because of the nature of the competition. On both sides, on the Republican side and the Democratic side, we've got the potential for a three-way primary because you've got three candidates time, on... Right? Now, both sides, which country. are arguably top tier. So when you have three candidates in the top tier, there's the possibility for all sorts of mayhem to result because you don't have a simple one-on-one -on -one matchup, but there's always the possibility that you could get two of the three, say, Democrats. You could get Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama in some kind of fight. And when you've got two candidates in a multi-candidate primary going at it, there's always the potential for a third candidate to zoom up out of nowhere and seize the day uh, while the two are squabbling amongst themselves. And there's that real possibility uh, on both sides. So that means that strategy and tactics at the end could play even more of a part than it usually would. What do you imagine 2008, what, what, what answers will it, will it provide? You could provide some significant answers on both sides. Uh, one is uh, on the Democratic side, It'll be very interesting to see what Barack Obama does among progressive liberal we'll Democrats in the state, uh, the so-called Volvo Democrats. How two years in the Senate gives you the breadth of experience, both nationally and internationally, to tackle the job. I have been in Washington for two years. So if your criteria for leadership is how long you've been in Washington, I'm definitely not going to be your choice. And I think if Obama's going to have a good shot uh, at winning the whole nomination, he's going to have to put together some coalition of those more progressive, more prosperous Democrats and African Americans. And so to the extent that Obama's doing well in places like Keene and Hanover and the Seacoast, uh, that could spell a good night for him, not just in New Hampshire, but nationally as well. Uh, and for Hillary Clinton, if she can show support, not just in places like Manchester and Rochester, but also places like, say, Merrimack in Bedford, uh, then she may have an easier road to the nomination than people might expect. On the Republican side, I think if it's the case that independent voters flock to the Democratic primary, then we could have really set up uh, what would be a base primary in which Republican voters, core Republican voters, decide whether it's Rudy Giuliani or John McCain or Mitt Romney. And so, in a way, the New Hampshire Republican primary may be more indicative of what's going to happen nationally than it has been uh, in the last decade. I do not know any time in the life of this country when a comparable responsibility has been placed upon the people of the United States. Can you go a little bit through the, the, the history of the primary, when it started, how did it begin? Well, the, the first New Hampshire primary was held in 1916, and it was part of uh, that overall uh, progressive reform movement, again, trying to get the process of deciding who is president into the hands of more people, rather than the typical smoke-filled room that you think of. The, the New Hampshire primary became first in the nation in 1920 when we moved back to coincide in good practical New England sense with our uh, uh, town meeting, which was held traditionally the first week of March. In 52, uh, that was the first modern primary where you could go into a voting booth and put a check mark next to the actual candidate. And when the ballots were totted up, it was a clean sweep for General Eisenhower on the Republican side and for Senator Estes Kefauver heading the Democratic slate. We're still in Concord, and now we're going to meet with Rich Killian, one of New Hampshire's greatest Republican consultants 
and a consultant for the Mitt Romney presidential campaign. Hey, buddy, how are you? How's it going, man? Good. Well, here's what we're going to do. Is she doing Anywhere you mic? want. Yep. Could this go down as the greatest New Hampshire primary ever? I think so, because besides Republicans, on the Democratic side, I mean, it's wide open. For the first time in 50 years, there's no, an, there's no incumbent running, no vice president, no president, or no real heir. I mean, Hillary Clinton is being challenged very strongly by a, a first-term U.S. Senator and by a U.S. Senator that only served one term. And it's a very strong challenge. And that's great for the state because it's really going gonna, it's, it's gonna to drive turnout. All the media attention to these events, that will drive turnout. All the engagement, that will drive interest and drive turnout. On the Republican side, there are three a very strong first-term candidates and a number of very strong candidates behind them. How much time does the campaign spend talking about the calendar in general? The state may be moving up or this one's not. Is there a lot of emphasis put on the calendar because it matters in terms of the timing of your campaign? I mean, is, is there like a special conference call that talks about here's the updates from the last 50 states largely just reading press clippings? I mean, is there a lot of... Actually, no, because uh, like anything in life, uh, you only focus on things you can control. And there's nothing, I mean, uh, one thing, just speaking as not someone from the Romney campaign, as a citizen of the state, one person controls when, when the New Hampshire primary is going to be set, and that's Bill Gardner. Now we're inside the State House to meet with Secretary of State Billy Gardner to get his perspective. Historically, what have been the greatest primaries we've ever had? Well, I think because it was at a young age for me, but uh, in 1968, what happened in New Hampshire led to President Johnson uh, deciding that he was not going to run for president again. And he made that announcement within a week after the New Hampshire primary. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Uh, how does this particular primary compare in terms of these other great primaries? Is this the greatest primary we could possibly have? Well, I think there's no question that this has the potential to be the greatest of all. And that's because I, I think that it's very likely that we'll have more candidates on the ballot in this primary than in any other primary. I'd like to talk with you a few minutes about Iraq. During my years, there's been somewhere between 300 and 400 names on the ballot. If we add up the, all the presidential primaries that I've been in this office during, the most we ever had was a little over 60 in 1992. And it would really surprise me if we didn't exceed that number this time. You know, he is such an encyclopedia of knowledge that it's important to get the... Uh when you're trying to figure out this question of whether or not this is the greatest New Hampshire primary, uh, here's a person who can put it all in context and perspective. Why are you here today? Why, why, why you have Governor Richardson at Roby's? Well, I think this is a traditional place, you know, and people can uh, associate with Roby's. This is a, just a great place, and there's so many places in New Hampshire that um, people like to come in here. I mean, look at this turnout at noontime. This is a great place. That's the essence of campaigning in New Hampshire. That's what I like, grassroots campaigning. I believe this could be the greatest New Hampshire primary ever because New Hampshire has got to make sure they're first. And despite all these national polls on who's ahead, who's the most celebrity, who has the most money, I think whoever appeals to New Hampshire will get the huge momentum to move to the next primaries. So I think New Hampshire has to take this primary very seriously and quiz the candidates and scrutinize them and get them in their homes and talk to them, grassroots. And uh, it's an enormous responsibility, but one that New Hampshire has always served very well. Do you have one favorite memory yet of New Hampshire? Yes, I do. Uh, my favorite memory was in a house party. I had a New Hampshire, I'd take a look at my boots and say to me, <laughs> Are those boots an endangered species? Because I'm a Westerner from New Mexico. That's my favorite story. Uh, they were an endangered species, but I'm for sure now, I'm not wearing my boots today. The old analogy of running for president used to be that 
Running for president was like running a marathon. It was grueling, it was long. The candidates that do the best are the candidates that have the most stamina. Uh, that analogy is outdated. And we began to explore an analogy last year in 2006 that what it's really like is like a NASCAR race. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you're at in lap 50. All that really matters is when we're in the last five, 10 laps, are you in a position to win? Where anything can happen. Um, we saw that, of course, in 2004 when Gephardt and Dean, who were the, among the front runners, took each other out and basically had a wreck, if you want to continue the analogy. And Kerry and Edwards is kind of, we're in a position to win to sweep up. So now we're in Manchester at the center of New Hampshire, where the New Hampshire Federation of Republican Women are holding their annual lilac luncheon. Uh, it's a chance for a lot of the campaigns to hand out their literature, get better known, buy a table, and get together and talk about things. You're the president of this organization, is that right? Yes, I am. Now, we're just we're going around the state today, we're trying to figure out if this really could be the greatest New Hampshire primary that's ever existed. And I'm, I'm looking inside and I'm seeing all of these different signs and these candidates and buying all these tables. Right. Is, is this been one of the better fundraisers that the, your organization has had because of the influence of the presidential campaign, campaigns? I hope so, and I think it might be because we have, you know, there's no incumbent. We have a slate of um, many people who are running, and they've been in and out of the state, and now we're going to get them and their campaigns in one room talking to people. Um, and it's exciting. It's right after the first uh, national debate in California. So um, I think it's going to be very exciting and get a lot of um, people more interested in the different candidates and asking good questions. What's at stake in this election, particularly for the Republican primary? Is it going to set the tone for the Republican Party for the next couple of decades, or is this about the particular candidates, or what, what do you see as, as stake? Well, I, I think the primary is at stake is for us to uh, pick the best person to run the country for the next eight years. Uh, and our economy is at stake, um, our, our war against terror is at stake, and um, who's going to carry us for the next eight years to make sure that this country stays as great as it is right now. New Hampshire has long been known as a bump in the road for front runners. <laughs> and this year is no exception. On the Republican side, wouldn't New Hampshire be where the battle is waged. I mean, all three front runners, you can make a plausible argument, have to win in New Hampshire, don't they? I think that's true. I mean, I think uh, you've got to look at, I mean, Iowa clearly is uh, historically been more important in the sense that social conservatives are there in a way that they aren't here in New Hampshire. But who knows what social conservatives are going to do? Are they going to vote as a block this time? Are they going to be splintered several different directions? In which case, New Hampshire could be a forerunner or a taste of what's going to happen, say, in Florida or what's going to happen in California or New York State. So in a way, if social conservatives aren't going any one particular way, then maybe New Hampshire is going to be more uh, emblematic of what's going to happen later on. But do you buy the premise of the all three frontrunners, John McCain, defending champion, has to win New Hampshire, is out. Mitt Romney, the neighbor, has to win New Hampshire, is out. Rudy Giuliani, the only state that allows independents to vote, even if they're going to vote in the Democratic primary, the only state that allows independents to vote, he has to get an early win. This would be where he would do it. Do you buy into that premise? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think it's New Hampshire's going to be a real crossroads uh, for all three candidates. And you can make an argument for all three. In fact, I do it pretty much every day. <laughs> I make an argument for each of them uh, or an argument against each of them, actually, better put, is and try to make an argument as to who has the inside track here, but all three bring strengths to the table, to be sure. Is this on? Yes. Mr. Green, did you turn on my You asked please? for me if you would... I am paying for this microphone, Mr. Green. We're in Concord at the new state Republican headquarters meeting with its new chairman, Fergus Cullen. This is Phil and know. Keely. What would this primary mean internally within the party? Well, it couldn't come at a better time for the New Hampshire Republican Party in terms of new energy, new blood coming into the party again after what was a tough election for us last year. So we're excited about that. And certainly the crowds that I'm seeing at Republican events, I was in Keene the other night for a Lincoln Day dinner, 200 people. I didn't know we had 200 Republicans in Cheshire County. But there is an energy and excitement that's coming into the party now and that's helped by the, Repub by the presidential primary, and we really do need it. Well, I love New Hampshire. And, we love you. And 
And I love Iowa, too. Now we're going to talk to Kathy Sullivan, who just retired as the Democratic Party chair in the state. She's also the longest serving Democratic Party chair in the state. Hey, how are you? I know, how about that? For <laughs> once, huh? You want to do this outside or in there? Where you, you know what's up to you? Want to do it outside? You want to do it outside? What are the other historical years we could kind of judge this, this one against? Boy, I really think um, it's obviously been a long time since you've had a situation like this. Um, in 1992, yeah, we had a pretty wide open Democratic field, and a, but a smaller field on the Republican side, actually, because, you know, you had Bush running for re-election, um, the first Bush. Um, as I said, 1988, um, you had a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans running, and so things got kind of crazy then, so it's somewhat comparable. But what you have this time that you haven't had in a long time is just an incredibly unpopular president on his way out the door. It is clear that we need to change our strategy in Iraq. This may also be the longest campaign season. What, is, what, what, what does that mean? What, mean what do you make of that? It means that we're crazy. <laughs> That's what it means. It's insane. There is no reason to have this long a uh, nominating process. You know, ironically, we don't know today what the big issues are going to be a year from now. I mean, what happens if the war in Iraq is ended? And that's what's, that's all we're talking about now, and rightfully so, because it's a, it's it's a major, important, critical issue. But something can happen between now and next January. We don't know what the important issues are going to be in October of 2008 when the general election is taking place. And so we're making determinations and judgments now based on a situation that may not be the same as we go forward. So it's, it's not good. And I'm afraid that we will turn people off the process because of this never-ending campaign. You know, it's not good. It's not good. In years past, the New Hampshire primary has been threatened, at least from other states. How is this year particularly unique? We went through something pretty similar back in 1983, uh, where we had one of the parties saying that uh, we could not have the primary on the day that we were going to have it, uh, and that if we did, we would be excluded from the national convention. We wouldn't be able to have uh, any delegates participate from this state and that actually went as late as the middle of June, six weeks before the convention. We think the New Hampshire primary is pretty threatened uh, this time around with so many states trying to move up. But even Florida, a state that is breaking Democratic National Committee rules, the threats that the DNC is saying we're going to punish you with for breaking these rules are very mild compared to what New Hampshire was facing. Uh, back in the 80s, so uh, it just reminds you that it's not the national parties that have a, have a say in these state elections. Uh, they're state elections, they're run by the state, they're paid for by the state, they're administered by the state, and the state decides when they're going to have it and when they're not, and the national parties really don't have uh, that much power. Concerned about our federal budget priorities. Uh -huh. um, Sixty billion dollars is wasted in Cold War and obsolete weapons. If elected president, would you shift the wasteful Pentagon spending into human needs like education and health care and energy independence that you spoke of earlier? You're obviously on the inside of the Mitt Romney campaign. Now, obviously, you weren't around in 1968 when his father ran. But would, is New Hampshire, do you believe, more important today than it would have been in, back in 1968, and why? I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's more important, frankly, than even it was uh, 15, 20 years ago, partially because, uh, uh, partially because of the front-loading. We saw in 2004, if states were concerned about the influence New Hampshire had, the way to do it was to draw out the election, was to actually uh, spread it out old supply and demand. They actually restricted supply and moved everything forward. And you start end faster. It's going to end even faster this time, which is going to really make New Hampshire and Iowa, frankly, even that more important, only because of momentum generation, uh, because of the coverage of the media. In 2000, there was an awful lot of talk about in internet and how it was going to change politics. But like any new, um, any new technological improvement, 
um, it only reaches its height level when, uh, when activists and real people take it and actually mold it. We're seeing it now. What's going to happen is uh, people like you are going to interview a candidate early in the morning, but what they say at the next forum in public is, is going to be taped and on the internet by, uh, by citizens. And that's going to affect how you cover the event and how you cover the after event. So it's a complete change. So what happens in New Hampshire is going to affect everywhere else because it's going to be what the candidates say and do and how the media cover it as well. I'm a Democrat and I, I like so much of what you're saying. And um, I just wanted you to know though that I'm against the war. In a way the technology brings New Hampshire into living rooms in Oregon and living rooms in Washington State and all those sorts of places. Uh, and in a sense, I think, it, you know, in some ways technology could not make the primary more national, uh, but I don't know that that's going to, but New Hampshire is going to be the theater or the lens through which people experience that national primary because once people are voting nationally, a big uh, piece of information they're going to take is what happened in New Hampshire and maybe in Iowa as well. So we're now at the Bedford Town Hall, where Michelle Obama, of course Barack Obama's wife, will be speaking to a group of uh, supporters and maybe some people that are going to try to join the campaign. And with us we have Jim Demers, who's a, an advisor to the Obama campaign, longtime New Hampshire guy, a reign for Congress himself. We haven't spent our lives dreaming about the bubble that we're in. Let's talk about the primary calendar. When you're talking to the Obama campaign, they're asking for your advice. Not necessarily, I'm not asking for trade secrets here, but how much time is, this, is, is spent discussing the calendar? What states are moving where? How do they react? Where does New Hampshire fall into that? Is there a lot of discussion about that? There's not a lot here in New Hampshire. I mean, we know what our mission is. We're trying to get the candidate here as often as possible for the type of personal campaigning that New Hampshire is known for. But I think, you know, regardless of the campaign in the main headquarters, there's a lot of talk. Uh, and it has to be concerning for some campaigns that, as you have maybe half the country uh, ready to select the nominee uh, within the first week of February, that money's going to play a very big part. And you can be a very viable candidate, but if you don't have the resources to leave New Hampshire and, and carry on, then you're in big trouble. Thank you for your time. When we try to ask this question of whether or not it would be the greatest primary, what are, the, what are the reasons why it would not be? Why it would not be? Well, it would not be if, uh, for instance, you know, people vote in New Hampshire and the other states just don't pay any attention whatsoever. You know, if, if the primary wound up being another bump in the road, as George W. Bush called it back in 2000, I think that would be a uh, reason. But, uh, you know, with all the front loading, uh, paradoxically, it doesn't seem to be uh, depriving New Hampshire of candidate visits and so forth. In fact, I think what could happen in the fall is that more and more candidates come to New Hampshire with the hope of gaining an additional edge. What's going to happen in 2012? <laughs> I'm a little worried about 2012 simply because we always have to worry about the New Hampshire primary. There will always be states that are out there um, trying to undermine our first in the nation status. You know, this whole debate over the 2008 calendar was generated by Washington insiders who were trying to establish some control over the nominating process. That's what this has always been about. Um, I think it's time for the DNC and the RNC to stop playing games with this and to say, all right, let's figure out what's the best way, what's the best calendar to nominate our nominees, what's best for the country. That is an issue that is going to be I guarantee you will be dealt with uh, in February and March of next year when both parties realize this is no way uh, to, uh, to run a presidential selection process. No one really knows what the cumulative effect may be of New York and California and all these states being compressed, but there is one thing you do know is that coming forward it really makes Iowa and New Hampshire that more important because the momentum coming out of those states. And we have made it pretty clear that we think that what happens here is beneficial for the country and that we've had it a long time. We never took it from anyone else and we don't want to just give it up because a state either had better weather or is bigger or if the debate was something else, uh, 
we would we would face that debate and talk about it, but uh, but so far uh, there's been nothing other than try to diminish the value of this small state, and and we don't want to let that happen. New Hampshire has spoken, and experts are looking for more straws in the political wind. Well, I hope you have enjoyed the day on the campaign trail. As to that question, are we in the midst of the greatest New Hampshire primary ever? Well, we saw the factors at play, the number of front-loading going on from states, the size of the candidate field, and the length of the campaign season. But as to if it is the greatest primary, time will tell. I'm James Pindle of the Boston Globe, filling in for Beth Carroll on New Hampshire Outlook. See you later. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks so much. I'll well, let you go back to your work. Okay. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot for doing this. All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Great. Wonderful. Great. Good to see you. That off. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, man. Perfect. Thanks for coming awesome. in. Awesome. Great Wonderful. talking to you. Good. Thanks to the Stratford Foundation for providing continuing major funding for the production of New Hampshire Outlook.